everyone. The hour of six o'clock having arrived, I'll call this December workshop to order and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for Thank you, everyone. Uh, Madam Secretary, are, th are there any citizens to be heard on the Zoom or that have contacted us? They're not there, Scott. Okay. Anyone on Zoom? So no, no one on Zoom is seeking recognition either? Or you, folks can if they would like. Now would be the time. All right. We don't do that for the workshops. So, I guess no one wants to um, address us. We'll move into presentations. And if Deputy Mayor will join me at the podium. And uh, the firm. Well, and perhaps the Director of Parks and Rec. I don't know. <laughs> 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 all right good evening so last month as you uh, will recall we took the opportunity to start to recognize some of our employees projects undertaken and accomplishments attained throughout the last several years we had hoped to start highlighting some of the employees' efforts and the services provided to our residents and businesses starting in 2020. However, due to the pandemic, we held off until just recently. So tonight is the second in a series of such recognitions. Joining me tonight are members from our Parks and Recreation staff, as well as a member of our traffic department we will also recognize another member of our team who works for the sewer plant but and who could not be here this evening uh, for his involvement with the parks and recreation projects and other activities undertaken. So while small in numbers, as you can tell, I always say these individuals before you are mighty when it comes to energy and impact within our community as they are responsible for 18 parks, well, soon to be 19, a community center, a pool, a cabin, a residential rental property, exterior maintenance needs at the police department, town hall, and various public areas and sidewalks adjoining our facilities. All of that as well as recreation programming that hundreds enjoy seasonally. So I wanna just take you back to 2020, just like we did with the last group of recognitions. Uh, and the Burr's collaboration with Community Cares, which transitioned our Stewart Community Center into a temporary shelter operation to provide services to those living without a permanent shelter or who were at risk of losing shelter. What began as a call for a hygiene stations between CARES Executive Director Beth Kemp, our Emergency Management Coordinator, Fire Chief Snyder, and I in early 2020 grew into a more in-depth conversation on the homeless community's lack of access to hygiene and other precautionary measures within the CARES facility. Given the Stewart Community Center had been closed since early March 2020 and all programming had been postponed or canceled, Council believed it made perfect sense to utilize the facility for a temporary shelter operation. Within 30 hours of being notified of Council's decision that the facility transitioned to temporary shelter the group behind you implemented a plan and all relevant equipment, files, etc., including staff, transferred from the Stewart Community Center to their new temporary home at Town Hall. 
and keys were delivered to CARES within 30 hours. I personally witnessed the transfer underway as in, and was impressed by the professionalism and commitment of our staff. It was a seamless transition and they did so with such energy and optimism deserving of recognition. I know that uh, Andrea will speak more about each member, so I won't uh, go there right now on uh, each member as far as their service years, et cetera. Uh, but I did wanna highlight that staff's creative spirit and optimism has stayed true throughout the pandemic as they continue to adapt with the closure of the community pool and other cancellations or modifications to park areas, as well as programming. However, what they did do, like I said, is they tapped into their creative spirit and they stayed optimistic and they decided what kind of programming could they accomplish including such things as a virtual summer artist series, operating some outdoor programs, as well as summer day camp. And they decided they were gonna hold a Halloween trunk or tree in lieu of the annual Halloween parade in 2020. They were additionally were responsible for the implementation of the registration and online sales of our trash bags, if you recall, which continues to this day. They were the ones that were responsible for being able to pull that online sale off with the existing software that we had here at our disposal. I just now wanna move forward to just more recent times. I know Marlon is here with us. Uh, I don't believe Bill could be here this evening. Uh, Marlon is one of our newer employees, um, employed in May of 2019, and Bill Kant has come to us a year later. Both gentlemen are known for their creative ideas and problem solving. For example, Marlon put his creative cap on and helped to craft a removable containment box for the dump truck to assist with the parks and rec portable leaf vacuum that was purchased in 2021. Between the new equipment and the containment box that was handcrafted by our staff, the overall leaf pickup operation in our parks performed by both Marlon and Bill has become so much more efficient. You're talking a one or two man operation. So uh, efficiencies, always seeking efficiencies is necessary and we applaud Marlon for that. I also want to note that Marlon stepped up and volunteered to become certified by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture for administering pesticides and passed category 10 for rights away and category 24 for swimming pools. Given limited resources, we often stress among our department's collaboration and it's been key during uh, in order to meet certain objectives as well as emergencies. For example, in preparation of opening the pool, Travis Rule, who actually is uh, a member of our sewer plant operation, he is a mechanic there, was tapped into on two different occasions. We needed someone who could respond quickly and focus on rebuilding and replacement of our motors at the pool, including the main pool motor. We were under a time crunch and Travis delivered. Since his hiring as a mechanic at the sewer plant, Travis has also been willing to learn other facets of the borough's operations, including cross training at the water treatment plant to hone his skill sets, along with helping to alleviate any potential backlog of maintenance issues that may arise during vacations or illnesses. Another key member who's on the end. <laughs> Hi, Van. <laughs> Van actually has been here and I've uh, enjoyed um, Van very much. 
2004 or 2005? Five. Yes, hired in 2005. Van is a borough resident. I like to tap into Van often to see what the borough looks like through his lens. As a borough employee, as a borough resident, taxpayer and ratepayer. He oversees our traffic division, huge traffic division. Yeah, as you know, many signals, many intersections, and it's a one-man show. But he's also been a key member of working behind the scenes during emergencies, snow removal, those call-outs for deficient signalization, etc. Not to mention, you'll often find him behind the scenes of the parades, including the Halloween parade, installation of holiday decorations downtown, and most recently undertaking a key objective in Andrea's department, the Latorte Pickleball and Tennis Court Lighting Replacement Project. So we did that in-house and that was Van. Van, again, takes great pride in this work, demonstrating a strong work ethic and an eye for seeking efficiencies, which is very much welcomed and appreciated. Lastly, as we noted previously, this group's willingness to step up is to be commended as they do so without pause. Two occasions just this year, July 4th, fireworks. Both of the gentlemen standing behind me can uh, vouch for that, the mayor and deputy mayor, as well as most recently, and we know it hit the headlines, the holiday parade and making spirits bright. A call went to Andrea Kraus, and again, without pause, she said, we will do it, Susan. And uh, I know that she's, she and her staff are somewhat challenged given the limited amount of time, but uh, we have full confidence in them. So with that being said, uh, I did want to pass it over to Andrea quickly, and then I know the mayor and deputy mayor have a presentation. Righty. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Borough Council for taking the time to recognize the Parks and Recreation staff for their efforts. Um, also, special thanks to Susan uh, for her leadership with actually the development of the entire borough team and um, her emphasis on cooperation among departments. Thank you. All right. The Parks and Recreation staff. <laughs> I don't know if I can get through this. <laughs> Hopefully I can. <laughs> Hopefully I can get through it. Okay. <laughs> they are a wonderful uh, team of people. Um, I'm uh, incredibly proud to be part of the team and proud of the effort they bring to the job on a daily basis. Um, we are a mighty department of seven full-time employees. We have varied skills, life experiences, and working knowledge of borough operations and systems. All right, so now I kind of want to um, highlight some of our individuals here. Um, first, Kristen. <laughs> Kristen has been full-time with the borough for about 16 years. Um, probably in total with part-time work. Um, she's probably actually worked maybe 18, 19 years for the borough. Um, she actually started part-time years ago, even before I started here, um, as a lifeguard at our pool. Um, after that, um, she was a recreation intern for me back in 2002. Um, and then went to college, graduated um, from Penn State, and um, then became our part-time recreation assistant. And then after that, she was promoted in 2006 and um, became the full-time uh, recreation and pool manager, and she's been that ever since. Um, so her knowledge of recreation and pool operations is invaluable. 
Okay, Melinda. <laughs> uh, Melinda has been employed for the borough for just about 10 years. Um, Melinda's work in the Parks and Recreation Office and particularly with the Community Center reservations and um, scheduling of part-time center supervisors is much appreciated. Um, she's very detail-oriented and, and that is appreciated as well. She also works tirelessly with the Shade Tree program. And sometimes that's not easy, but she does, she works with that. <laughs> Kelsey. Um, Kelsey just celebrated her five year anniversary with the borough, and I can hardly believe that the time has passed so quickly. Um, Kelsey brings a lot of enthusiasm to the department by creating recreation programming for youth and adults, as well as sports leagues for the community. Marlon. Marlon started working for the borough about two and a half years ago. He's been very helpful in maintenance operations, especially during, during our times of staff transition, which we've, we've had a bit of that the past couple of years. Um, as Susan said, um, I, I too am uh, especially grateful that he stepped up um, this past summer and became certified um, to apply pesticides with the Department of Ag. He can do uh, right-of-ways and the swimming pool. Um, Bill and Matt, those two aren't here. There are two other park maintainers. They're the newest Parks and Rec employees. Um, Bill's made an immediate impact on the department. He's only been here for seven months, but he, he has made an immediate impact. Matt, he's only been with us for three days. <laughs> so, um, his story is yet to be told, so. <laughs> um, but we're, we're really looking forward to working with him. And Van, I know you're not my employee, but today you kind of seemed like you were. Um, he helped, um, well, he hung park or, uh, no parking signs for the holiday parade, helped with lighting at Fort Latour, and I talked to him about uh, community center lighting, so he's sometimes, Van is definitely my go-to person. Um, and Travis, he's not here, but he helps wonderfully at the pool. And I know Kristen loves working with him. So um, basically uh, each and every one of the employees, these employees display a positive attitude about the job. Their heart is in the right place and they try their best for the community. So thanks to all of you <laughs> for making <laughs> Oh gosh, each day um, of work, something we can be proud of. And on that note, it is my pleasure, um, it's a pleasure of uh, Mayor Alex Schultz and the Borough Council to present uh, those of you that are here with these great certificates. It's a token of our appreciation, but we know you do so much more each and every day. And you're the only department that I can think of that actually makes residents happy. So good for you. Keep up the good work. Most not. Yeah, you probably know better than I do, but at least the ones that talk to me anyway. So, all right. Uh, first up, Van Thorson. Kelsey Najik. <laughs> is, is Bill Porter here? Bill's not Bill's here, right? Not. Okay. And neither is Travis. So that ends my part. Deputy Mayor. So and I, I said this last month, and, 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 and because it's true, I want to reiterate that for every employee who comes here. We get compliments as council members, the mayor and I, um, out you know in the public. Um, I know we've, we've gotten compliments about um, a number of things that, that Andrea, your staff, is involved in. Um, you'd be surprised how, how appreciative people are of just the, the trash bags being, being delivered and having put that together online. And the Christmas parade, Melinda, I know we have, you know, we have some neighbors in, in common, right? And I know the kids on the block are, are pretty, pretty excited about, uh, about the parade this Saturday. And you folks all pulled that off. And Marlon, you know, you, you, all the work that you put in every single day that goes goes unsung. We appreciate everything that you do. So, 
Um, Kristen, we've we've served on summer fair years ago together too. So there, you know, our employees don't only do the job here, um, the work of the borough, but they're also out there in the community, um, help helping create a, a greater quality quality of life. So, Kristen, could you come up, come up, come on up, and thank you. Thank you. And Melinda, you're next. Melinda's a bit of a, uh, a social media star. I don't know if everybody knows this. She has to live with her husband, unfortunately. <laughs> Melinda, come on up. <laughs> Thank you. Marla, thank you again for everything. Thank you, Marla. And of course, the, the fearless leader who's <laughs> 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 had enough tonight. You want to go back to your seat, right? Yes. So, <laughs> but Andrew, you, you know the the, the the leadership at the at the top is is incredibly critical. So, um, you know, you, you your team works because 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 of you to a great uh, in great part. So, okay. thank you, thank you for your leadership. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We now return to our regularly scheduled program, and uh, I. I uh, I'll turn things over to Councillor Hicks for the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, I'm going to be taking about 45 minutes of uh, people's times. Um, but before I, I get focused on the Climate Action Commission's uh, first deliverable to Council, which is our version one of the Climate Action Plan, um, there are some uh, young students here with, with their faculty member who um, represents just a part of the outpouring of literally reaching out to us on the commission to um, uh, volunteer to help us uh, achieve um, our, our goals. I, I will say most of what the students are working on are, are directly related to mitigating um, some of our sources of carbon emission and meeting some of our objectives. Some of them, um, uh, some of the students, as you'll hear, um, are working on wider sustainability goals. Um, I, I will call them on, in some occasions as co-benefits that have multiple um, uh, uh, benefits to, to meeting um, our, our climate and sustainability, sustainability goals. Um, We've had students reach out uh, in, in droves um, uh, from Dickinson, from Widener University, um, members of our um, Climate Action Commission leads um, and um, other fellow counselors, particularly Brenda Landis, really trying to guide um, the students' focus. And, and I am really quite excited and pleased that at all the information we've been able to collect that uh, I think we have in a good position to, um, with, with a little bit of direction and guidance from council and staff to really start moving forward on accomplishing some of these um, objectives. Um, so tonight, um, what you're going to hear from the students, uh, five students um, under the uh, tutelage of um, Professor Maggie Douglas, who I believe is here tonight, um, and she has worked really closely with, with uh, those on the commission and with the students. And um, I'll just say uh, the work that I've seen up to this point has been outstanding. Um, uh, better than some of the graduate level pro projects I get uh, for what it's worth, but that's um, uh, for the short time period that they have locked down on a specific project, they've made tremendous progress. So um, I'll, I'll roll back when I get to talking about the Climate Action Plan and, and showcase how the work you're hearing tonight fits into some of our actions. But I'm gonna uh, turn the floor over. 
Um, unless there's an objection from the students or uh, Professor Douglas, um, we'll go in the order of uh, Anna Conley, then Lily Dickinson, Jackie Gregor, Jordan Dean, and no Nuhan Abid. If that's if that works for everybody, I know at least one of you needs to roll out of here pretty quickly. And um, so, um, Stephanie, if we could get the first presentation, I'd like to invite uh, Anna um, to uh, share with Council sort of the, uh, her capstone project, um, who's focused on on green alleys. Okay, so I have focused my capstone on having Carlisle hopefully implement a green alley. Um, I've been meeting with Joel and Brenda about where it should be. And we've right now picked the location of West Church Avenue, like the alley between like G-Man and um, Grand Illusion. And so there's a bunch of like foundations, like the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and EPA are working to improve runoff and like total maximum daily load, which is the amount of pollutants that run into watersheds in a given day. And they've picked, I think it's like five main counties in Pennsylvania to reduce that and Cumberland County is one of them. And a bioretention system is a great way to decrease those pollutants that go into the watersheds. And a green alley is a type of bioretention system that will filter the runoff and hold it for a certain amount of time. So it decreases the amount of water that makes it in to our sewer systems and watersheds in a given moment and filters it so it has less pollutants in it. Um, so I wanna talk about how green alleys can be varied depending on the location. Um, so there's a couple different types of pavements um, and the type that you pick depends a lot on like, will there be vehicle traffic or is it a pedestrian walkway? Do you want it to be like a community gathering space or do you want like high vehicle traffic, that kind of thing. So there are also ways to improve like community safety as well, which is if you make it a community gathering space, you increase vegetation and like you improve the lighting so it's safer at night, but you do um, special lighting that doesn't um, do light pollution. And, and um, you also wanna test the soil to make sure that the water can pro properly infiltrate so it doesn't have overland flow issues. And you wanna test for the amount of runoff accumulating in the area. So I'll hopefully be doing an independent study on this next semester where I will be testing the soil and runoff accumulating in the area to make sure that it is a good site to implement a green alley. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. So these are all the types of things that can be done at a green alley and where it's successful and where it's not successful. So whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, it is a really important thing to keep in mind when you think of the location. So for the West Church Ave one, you don't wanna do anything that would be like only good for residential areas. Like composting is really only a good idea if it's a residential area, but you, let's say if you want a residential green alley, then you wouldn't wanna do natural detention um, just because it doesn't have the like vast amount of space that you would have. Um, so that's a really good thing to keep in mind when we're deciding if it's a good location and how successful it'll be. Um, so for the Carlisle Green Alley right now, um, before I've tested the soil and everything, I want, I've gone with the best idea would be permeable concrete because it has the greatest potential for the least amount of degradation. Um, there was a study outside of Chicago that um, did various different types of permeable pavement and watched it as it in the parking lot like went on throughout the, like the four years and permeable concrete had the least amount of degradation which would be good for the West Church Avenue because it has somewhat high vehicle traffic because it does lead to parking lots but it's also not necessarily like high traffic like West High Street would be um, and 
we could do permeable pavers on the sidewalk with vegetated areas on the side to increase safety. And also the pavers are cheaper, which means better for you guys. <laughs> um, but also because it's pedestrian traffic and not vehicle traffic on the sideways, you don't need that durability with the concrete that you get. Okay. Um, so you guys did want a cost analysis and it's a bit hard when you don't know how much space you're really going to convert to the green alley. But Dubuque, Iowa is in the process of implementing 240 and they're expecting the cost to be around 57 million in total, but that includes all materials and all labor costs, everything. Um, Chicago has a really extensive green alley program and it pays $45 for a cubic yard or 60 for a cubic meter for permeable concrete specifically. Um, and this was as of 2007 and that had decreased a hundred year or a hundred dollars since the year before, which is 2006. So it depends on the type of area, like do we have suppliers near here, that kind of thing. Um, that would need to be something that we talk about with like who we're sourcing supplies from. And also New York City has invested over $2 billion in green infrastructure and said that it resulted in savings from gray infrastructure and an additional amount of like $2 billion in deferred costs because the amount of runoff that decreases helps with the sewer like runoff areas because we have a combined sewer overflow system here when it we get massive storm events our drinking water and our sewer systems overflow into each other which means that we have to spend a lot more money to filter it out and clean it but if we don't have the amount of water that is entering the combined sewer overflows in the first place we won't have to spend that money to filter it in the first place um so that's basically what I have for that. And then I have one last slide on maintenance. Um, Chicago has found that with permeable concrete and their extensive green alley systems, they only need to run over it with a street cleaner about twice a year for it to stay clean and um, like the pores to be able to infiltrate and permeate the water properly. And I know that Carlisle already has a street cleaning system, so it shouldn't be a huge issue for you guys to add that. Um, but I did want to keep it brief because you guys did say four to five minutes and I'm already over that, so. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Anna. Um, yeah. And uh, I'd like to invite Lily um, to, um, if we could tee up her presentation and just to follow up on Anna's uh, presentation. Um, you know, we, a few of us uh, looking at candidate alleyways that would, uh, what I like to call as a, a potential pilot, I think the, the West Church area seems to make sense uh, obviously mu much more to to decide but um uh, i think we'll, we'll you know without objection at least look at that as a potential site as as we continue to work with uh, anna and, and uh, other students on on this project so really appreciate the work you've done so far it's been really beneficial and um i think we remember this, this is also beyond you know it's not just a sustainability project we've been talking about multiple ways we can use our alleyways to attract uh, the public to, to have a safe space that um, either permanently or occasionally you know doesn't have to worry about traffic flowing in and out to do that so this this might be a, a good situation to meet both of those goals so thank you yeah that, that's that's what we understand yeah yeah yep thanks anna um if, thank you uh, thank you very much I'd like to invite Lily. Up. Uh, Lily's going to talk to us a little. Uh, one of two uh, students working uh, on uh, gathering some information about um, uh, single-use plastic bags and uh, whether uh, reducing those um, and how we do so makes the most sense. So the floor is yours, Lily. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So my name is Lily, um, and I've been surveying local businesses in Carlisle about their current practices and opinions about potential plastic bag regulation. So my survey had three main parts. The first section was business demographics. So what kind of business are you? How many people work in your business? Um, how long have you been in Carlisle? Just to kind of see if there's a trend among retail or food and beverage services. And then I also asked them about their current practices. So what are they doing now? Are they using plastic products? Do they have recycling bins? Did COVID increase your plastic usage? 
And then the third part was kind of opinions and thoughts about hypothetical plastic regulations. So how do you feel about a plastic bag ban, a fee? What about recycling initiatives? Are there any barriers to these changes? Can the borough support you? Um, and what would a reasonable transition period be for you? So these are all things that the borough kind of asked me to research um, and that I thought would be helpful kind of background information moving forward. So getting into the results, um, just a quick disclaimer, I'm still collecting data. So right now I have about 25 responses, which it's a good start, but it's definitely not representative of the entire Carlisle businesses. So the sample size is a bit small, um, just to keep that in mind. <laughs> and I also, um, just to keep this a little bit brief, I didn't separate these, separate these results by the type of business, so it's a little bit broad. Um, but one of the first questions was, what are your thoughts on implementing signage, encouraging re reusable bags? So this one was majority positive, um, which kind of makes sense for me because um, it's pretty easy, pretty simple to do. Um, so that was one of the first things I asked. And then the second one was about charging a fee on single use plastic bags and the business keeping the revenue from that fee. So as you can see, this one was majority negative and a maybe. So people are a little bit more unsure about this one. And then this, the next few graphics, um, they're kind of on a sliding scale. So one is least favorable and five is most favorable. So this is in support of a ban on plastic bags. So you can see it's kind of distributed one, three, and five um, between that. And then this is replacing single use plastic products with recyclable materials. So a little bit more positive, but definitely nothing unanimous. And then voluntary compliance. So this is just if customers want to comply and use, um, reduce their single use plastic bag usage, they can, but there would be no kind of strict ban or anything. Um, and this was a little bit more positive. And then this is a little interesting. So this is asking about a reasonable transition period. So how long would it take your business to transition without hurting you? Um, so I kind of broke it down. The three most popular ones were zero to one month, six months to a year, or it's just not possible. Um, so again, this was out of about 20 responses. So it's not a huge sample size, but that's kind of where the results lay. And then this one, potential barriers. So a few notes about these. Um, if you see kind of the number qualifier, that means that more than one person said that. So for example, two people said that there were no barriers to change. And then any of the responses in quotations were spaces where on the survey you had a chance to elaborate and type in your own answers. So these are direct quotes from businesses about kind of their thoughts on this. Um, and the highlighted ones are just the more interesting ones that I found. I can give people a few minutes to read that. Yeah. <laughs> Lily, just, I mean, looking at those you know, briefly, and, and I know it's a small sample size, I mean, some of those, maybe some, some education about alternatives looks like it, it could be helpful. And I think that, and maybe you're going to draw that out um, as, as we go forward. Um, and so I think there's some benefit there. And, th and if we don't need to jump back to the slide, but the slide where there was the distribution on, on the ban on bags or the fee on bags, it was actually not quite a majority that said no there was a yes yes and maybe was the majority right so people again maybe there was an opportunity for some education maybe some of those maybe's turn into no's right but yeah um, but there it seems like there, overall there's there's an opportunity just for some outreach and education on the issue yeah one of the biggest trends i found was a lot of people were against it because they didn't really know what they would do in replacing plastic bags so that's kind of an opportunity for education and things like that which is interesting and a good thing to note um, but if people have had a chance to read this, we can move on. And then these are questions about how the borough can support people. Um, so again, you'll see how many people agreed with those options. Um, so there's a lot about education, offering incentives to switch to reusable materials, um, providing a longer transition time, economic support. And then the one at the bottom is a quote from a business and that's just providing signage at a zero dollar reduced cost to put in stores, encouraging reusables. 
And then these are just some additional comments. Again, these are things that businesses type directly into the survey. Um, one of the things I found was that the most opinionated people were not in support of plastic regulation. Um, people who were in support didn't really have much to say other than, yes, I would support it, things like that. So just something to note um, about businesses. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can just open up if you guys have any questions for me about anything, I'm happy to. Yeah, I just, I did want to comment that um, this was sort of a artificial uh, deadline for the students that didn't quite sync up to their deadline for the class, so they're still collecting information. I'm sure we'll get an update to some of the, this data. Um, and I, I did want to add too that um, there's there's two two of these projects uh, sing, um, continuing the work on single use plastics, um, either a fee a fee a ban doing nothing, incentivizing all those options, as well as um, achieving one of our targets of increasing EV um, uh, 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 uptake in, in 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 the borough is, is it going to be the second. Of, of a project that's going to be taken up by an environmental policy analysis class. So I think for these students work is going to be handed over to um, a, a, a class that will I guess, probably be divided pretty 50-50 to um, continue the work on developing alternatives and, and providing more options, uh, more research, uh, more um, uh, evaluation of possible alternatives. So. Um, you have not seen the last of Dickinson's contributions. Um, we, we also have a draft ordinance that addresses uh, how we might craft um, some sort of restriction on plastic bans that we um, have worked with Widener students to do. So um, as you can see, Lily's work is just really fundamentally going to help inform uh, the direction we can move forward. And I'd like to invite Jackie, who's going to basically give us the resident, um, some of the residents' um, responses to the same issue of single-use plastic bags. So thank you very much, Lily. Hello, um, my name is Jackie. Um, I'm a senior environmental studies major uh, at Dickinson. And whereas Lily was focusing on the business side of single-use plastics regulation, I focused on surveying resident attitudes on single-use plastics. Um, so for my research question, I wanted to answer, what are the attitudes and understandings of residents in Carlisle towards a single-use plastics phase-out and its environmental consequences? And then my methodology was a literature review on um, current consumer single-use plastic behaviors and case studies from other municipalities and cities. And then I conducted a digital survey via Google Forms that was um, sent out through the borough social media and through QR codes. And then I'll also be creating an infographic touching on that educational piece to raise awareness about single-use plastics um, in the borough. And the, the final results from the survey will be compiled into a report, uh, which I'll have in by the end of the semester, um, which details all of, all of the results and the infographic as well. Um, in terms of demographics, we've gotten 120 responses so far um, from a pretty diverse age range. Um, majority have at least a college degree. The majority of participants identify as white and 70% of participants identify as women. So even though this survey doesn't represent the full diversity of Carlisle and given the time period, it does have a quick turnaround and good amount of responses and it's still collecting data um, right now. So in terms of awareness and current attitudes, 85% um, of residents in Carlisle view plastics to be a global environmental problem, but only 77% view them to be a problem in Carlisle. 90% believe that plastics go into the general waste stream after their use, and 78% believe that they are recycled. So this 90% shows that people acknowledge and are aware that plastics are usually headed right to the trash after their use. Um, so the main sources identified for single-use plastics were grocery stores, chain businesses, and small businesses in that order. And the most often items are plastic bags and packaging from store-bought goods. 
overwhelmingly, the biggest barriers indicated on the survey were cost and convenience. Um, so in terms of cost, any alternative would need to be affordable to consumers, um, so wouldn't place any additional burden on the individual when at checkout to find an alternative bag. And this change would need to be made easy so they don't have to go out of their way other than maybe bringing their own bag like in their car or something like that. Um, and having reminders and signage that would make it easy to do so. So 90% of respondents believe that um, single use plastics consumption should be reduced. And then when it comes to how to go about doing this, 81% believe a plastic bag ban would be useful. And then in contrast, I believe around, yeah, 66 prefer a plastic bag fee. Um, and that fee uh, most popularly would be around five to 10 cents. And the funds from this fee um, would like to be, it's not pictured, sorry about that, but they would like to go to a community or green project. And then this shows when prompted to indicate which initiative they would most support that just over half of respondents would prefer a bag ban, while 30% would prefer to see a fee enacted, and around 20% would just prefer voluntary compliance. And then finally, just some implications from the other research I've been doing. Um, education has really come up a lot as key in how effective a ban or uh, fee is in rollout. Um, so this would allow time for businesses to phase out their current plastic supply, for consumers to warm up to the idea of bringing their own bag and get used to bringing their own in their car. Um, equity came up a lot in the open-ended comments on my survey and making sure that maybe if fee were implemented, um, it wouldn't put more of a burden on residents of lower socioeconomic status, uh, whereas wealthier shoppers might not feel the impacts of a fee at all. And then in terms of effectiveness, um, the success of a ban or fee initiative depends on the prices, types of alternative bags selected, and as well as the framing and narrative surrounding this initiative. Um, also in the comments section of this survey, there was some pushback to language like a ban or taking away options, whereas this initiative would seek to provide more sustainable options. Um, so narrative is another key thing to consider uh, when moving forward on something like this. And that's all I have, but I'm happy to share. Uh, we have a lot of comments and responses that I can share um, as a follow-up anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. One thing that really jumps out just in the data you've collected so far is, you know, there, there, there may be more of a reservation by businesses um, worried that residents wouldn't pay a fee, that residents may, may be a little bit more open to, to that and may uh, persuade business to be a little bit more favorable. We don't know. We'll still need to look at that. But that, that was one of the things that jumped out of these two uh, uh, this data, and um, again, we, we have a lot, lot to do. I think the point you made in making sure all the entire community is represented in this demographically, socioeconomically, more work to be done. This is a great start, and again, we're going to hand over Lily and Jackie's work to, to uh, a whole class who's going to um, move this further. So, uh, thank you very much, Jackie. I'd like to um, invite Jordan. <laughs> Jordan Dean, um, she, she's, um, her and Nuhan uh, Abid ha, are working on different elements of um, trying to improve our um, <clears throat> uptake of um, electric vehicles, which is one of our uh, goals in our climate action plans you'll hear later. Uh, I think as most of us know on council that um, we, we, we don't really have um, an infrastructure that is compatible with uh, owning electric vehicles. And Jordan has done a really uh, clever and interesting uh, project on a couple of our public parking facilities that uh, may help us inform where it makes the most sense to potentially put some uh, charging stations or otherwise incentivize people who use and operate EVs. So with that, Jordan. Hi, I'm Jordan. Like Joel said, I've been focusing on some of the parking patterns in downtown Carlisle just to get an assessment so that we know in the future if we decide to implement uh, charging stations where the best place would be for that. So the first thing I kind of want to talk about is how I've been gathering data. So before I kind of show you my results, what I've been doing basically is I've been going to two different lots. I've been looking at the lot on Pomfret Street. So it's close to where Anna's doing her project on the Green Alley. 
And the other lot I've been looking at is Lowther South lot, which is close to the Episcopal church in the back of the church. And what I've been doing at these lots is I've been looking at how full Pomfret and the Lowther lots are after, particularly after 5 p.m. So at these lots, there is a section of the lot that is public and there's a section of the lot that's also leased. So what I'm looking at, what I'm interested in is which part of these two spaces is going to be available because after 5 p.m. the leased spaces become public. So once they're public, that means that anybody can park in them and the public spaces, if what I found, there's research, research to indicate that people who are looking to charge their vehicle would more likely charge a vehicle after work, which would most likely be after 5 p.m. So if we're having people take up space to park and charge their vehicles for long extended periods of time, something that's important to know is whether or not the rest of the customers for parking would be able to park their cars in the, uh, the leased lots and also the public lots. So I've been looking at how full they are. I've also been looking at which spaces are most commonly used. So I'm gonna show you a few um, visualizations of how full and what spaces in particular are being used most often. Um, I've been counting the specific cars that have been at each spot, which has taken a tremendous amount of time. Um, <laughs> I've been taking uh, data of this for about 12 days. So 12 different days, I've gone to each of these lots after 5 p.m., counted the number of cars and which spots they're at, and then recorded that and compiled it into some data. So, and the last thing that I'm also looking at, which um, I had the opportunity to talk to Stacey Hamilton about some of the things that the boroughs also already has um, in terms of data. And she uh, suggested looking at the Pomfret garage as well, because there's she had the idea that there's um, already sort of a wall infrastructure that you'd be able to plug in and that there's also the added benefit of that the garage is close to the hotel, meaning that a lot of guests from either out of state or just long traveling distance would be able to use charging stations if they came with an electric car. So there's a little bit about that too. So. So what I found, um, I think the first, yeah, the first table that I have here is data that I got from Stacy about the types of patrons at the garage. So what this information is showing you is basically for all the cars that enter the lot, which one, which cars and how many of, I should say, how many cars are there for what reason? So what she had showed me, and I'm not exactly sure how this data is taken and how she has this information like where that comes from but what we've found is that the majority of people who are parking in the Pomfret garage are parking there for downtown visits um, but I think it's also important to note that hotel guests are also a significant portion of those visitors and I also think that because of COVID it's likely that a lot of visitors you might normally get in the garage from like further distances are traveling right now so I think this would be a really interesting area just to get more information later on. So, and this is also some data I got from Stacy. Um, well, um, in terms of, yeah, all of it is data I got from Stacy. So the Pomfret garage versus the Pomfret lot versus the Lowther lot. Basically what I did here was I looked at, cause she gave me transactions for the parking meters as well as the parking garage. So I also have data that reflects how many transactions on the parking meters were taken over the course of, and I should also note that the, group, the table beforehand also has information that goes from January of this year up until Halloween. So the past year basically um, is where this data has been taken. So what I did here was I took the number of spaces in each lot including the garage. And I took the data that she gave me about what number of people are parking in those spaces or more accurately doing a transaction. So, you know, putting coins in the meter or going through the, the parking garage per the number of spaces. So this data doesn't really show you much, I don't think, because it has, you can see that Lowther lot is utilized a lot for the amount of spaces that there are. Whereas I think Pomfret, and I, I could see this just from my visitations, that Pomfret lot is not used as regularly. But again, with the 
the meter transactions, there's no way to tell whether or not that's one car, two cars, or like if one car is like transactioning multiple times. So this this data is not necessarily conclusive any, of anything, but I think it does indicate that the louder and pomfret lots, um, the louder lot is utilized a little bit more often. So this graph is for the pomfret lot. As you can see on the, um, the left side of each of these groups of graphs is the public lot in the light green, least lot in the middle green, and the darkest green is the combined um, data from both lots together. So what this kind of indicated was that for the public lot, as you can see, it's almost at 100% almost all the time. I've separated it into weekdays, weekends, and all the days. So on weekends and weekdays, it's about the same. I wouldn't say there's much of a significant change. Um, but in the pub public lot, excuse me, there is mostly, um, it's mostly full. Um, not entirely full, but it's pretty full most times. And for palm fruit, it's actually a little bit more interesting. Uh, what I found was that, as you can see, it's a lot less full. Um, and particularly on weekends, I noticed that there was a lot of events that would happen, either like Carlisle Theater. I think the one day I went over and there was an orchestra concert. <laughs> so lots of cars were parked in the least side of the lot, um, which basically made the least bar go a lot higher than the public public side and the public side to be honest I did not see many cars I think Joel even mentioned to me that when you go on Google Maps and you zoom in there's like six cars in the palm front lot so yeah and this is a really complicated sort of picture but basically what I did here was I took maps of uh, I drew out maps of all of both parking lots on the left is louder louder and on the right is palm front and I just took data from each of the spaces and I indicated how many um, times that I went and I found that each space was occupied. So out of the 12 days that I was taking data, what percentage of the time was that space occupied? As you can see, the darker values are means it's more occupied and the lighter values means it's less occupied. So if we take a look at Lowther, the top part of that map is the public lot, which as you can see, I, I, you can't really see it because it's really tiny, but um, at those first six spaces on either side were always full. There was not a single day that I went to the Lowther lot and there was no car there. So I, I mean, as you can tell, there, there's less in the least lot, which indicates that you might have room to implement a charging station and people would still be able to park. So I think that's really beneficial because it indicates that you're your parking lot is not entirely saturated, so you have space and room. Um, in the palm fruit lot, you have a lot more space. What I kind of noticed was that there are more than, actually all of the, almost all of the spaces were not occupied, occupied more than 50% of the time. So at any given moment, if you go to the palm fruit lot at any space, you have maybe a 50-50 chance of seeing a car in any, any particular space. So what this means, I am still working a little bit on <laughs> this project. Clearly, I just got this data all compiled very recently. Um, but basically, some of the things I took away was that neither the Palm Frit or the Lowther Lodge reached 100% capacity, which is definitely a good thing if you're thinking about putting in chargers. Um, but many spots in the Lowther Lot do fill up in the public side. So that's especially on, um, I think, farmer's market days there's obviously lots of people in the lot on Wednesdays. <laughs> um, but, and the Palm Fruit lot is often empty, but can really get full on the weekends, especially with G-Man being in the close proximity and, and a lot of events in the theater. So that's also something to consider. And uh, the garage could eventually be a useful place for EV stations, but I think that'd be a great thing to study more in the future. Um, I didn't get a chance to look so much at the garage, but I think that'd be really, really interesting going forward. So, yeah. And I also would very much appreciate any suggestions about any of the things that I've been talking about, any like question you guys might have about data, because I know I did throw kind of a lot of <laughs> stuff at you at once, but yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs>
like it's simple but it's it's perfect and it actually tells a lot of information um in, in a quick look so thanks for thinking through that uh, this has utility well belong ev charging stations as we're looking at in, uh, parking challenges for de you know, high density uh residential this will help these sorts of approaches getting more informational help inform us on what, what's the real parking situation in our community and i love um we're off to a good start. I'm, I'm curious to see if we can get some potentially cheap technology so we can start looking at what is the average stay times. Obviously, uh, not reasonable for an undergraduate at Dickinson to sit and watch uh, and count it when every car comes and goes. But what you did collect was really, really helpful. Great job. Nuhan, good to have you, my friend. The floor is yours. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Before I start, I'd like to just take a moment to appreciate my peers. The work they've done is superb and amazing, and I spent the last 15-ish weeks watching these projects go. So I'm just really impressed with like where we started to versus where we are now presenting in front of you guys. So if you um, aren't as impressed as I am, you should be. <laughs> anyway, that being said, hello, everybody. I'm Nuhan. Some of you might recognize me as the summer intern for the Climate Action Commission's community engagement and outreach team. So Stephanie, if you can go to the next slide, please. So um, basically, I'm very interested in science communication. I personally believe that this kind of stuff should be easy and accessible to understand for public audiences. Like we shouldn't be giving them complicated materials to be like, all right, here's like the whole technical stuff. Um, do you get that? And that wouldn't really convince audiences. So I prefer my work that is public facing and the outreach materials reflect that. And Stephanie, you could pull up the infographics from the blue ones. So this is an infographic that I did for the CAC back in the summer. Um, we used this for outreach events when we were doing um, public events or, and we also put it on the Engaged Carlisle website, I believe, for people to look at and review what the Climate Action Plan would potentially have as main goals. So we just simplified these and put this into a very easy to read and understand form and just you know, made it like a fun design. This is the kind of stuff I'm trying to aim for with the electric vehicle project as well. In full disclaimer, like the rest of my peers right now, the project still isn't complete, but I have a draft infographic that I'll show you later on. Um, if you can go back to the presentation. So the whole um, fuss about electric vehicles is that I broke it down into three very simple reasons. One is cost. Cost is a big factor for anyone. Like, let's be real, money's big. Um, buying a new car is expensive. Getting people to justify a car, an electric vehicle, kind of hard when you consider the cost that might be involved. And then there's a little thing called rain anxiety, which is what if you get stranded while driving down? Like, what if your battery runs out because it's unreliable and you're not as sure compared to like a gas car might be? And the final factor I was considering was location, where you're buying a car in the kind of area you'd be using one in. So like in a small town like Carlisle, um, a lot of commuters would probably not be going super far on a regular basis, or they would be going to work in like Harrisburg or the surrounding area pretty frequently. So their driving distances is something that they want to consider and the type of car that they have is also something that would be a big issue. So I'm addressing these in infographic form with key variables that I've identified from research. I've looked at the prices of electric vehicles, the cost of charging. I've looked at utility prices um, from PPL's website and local average gas prices in Cumberland County. I've looked at some capabilities and fuel sources of commonly available electric vehicles. And I've also looked at commute distances that are likely that car local people might travel or hypothetical distances that might be more longer range travel. So there was an unfamiliar joke I had in here about graphic design to speak my passion. The PowerPoint actually has a different design. It did change over here, so this joke works even better in some ways. But um, my intended outcome is that I'm going to present all this information in a series of infographics that's going to be put on the um, borough website, which addresses 
the issues I mentioned before about rain anxiety, cost, and other factors that a Carlisle person might think about. So, if you can go to the next slide, please, Stephanie. Um, these are the vehicles that I've chosen for comparison. The Nissan Leaf is the most easily affordable electric vehicle on the market right now. And the Maxima is the gas car that I'm using to compare with it because it has similar technical specifications and price range. Um, so this is the range map that I made for the Leaf um, on a 40 kilowatt hour battery on a full charge. This can travel 226 miles so you can see the full range of the surrounding area that you can go to all the way far up is Rochester and south is somewhere in Virginia that I do not remember, or at least not visible on this map. I think and that's a one-way trip or two-way trip? On a one-way trip on a yeah, trip, yeah. So I'm um, Stephanie to go to, yeah. So um, my methods included, I was looking at the data from the website and making cost comparisons from local utility rates and comparing it to like whatever data the Nissan website gave me using the LEAF as my model for what kind of electric vehicle might be hypothetically purchased by Carlisle audiences. I created a bunch of range maps as well, and I'm providing some additional um, information in infographic form. If you can, um, Stephanie, pull up the infographic now. So right now this is a draft version of this. I like to be very finicky with my design, so I'm not really final on this, but I do prefer, um, I do like the direction I'm heading in right now. I'm trying to make it easy to read and understand, simplifying all the costs that involved here. So like I said, um, would it be easy to purchase? I researched into like the initial prices as recommended on the website, looked at like um, dealership prices and prepared them and saw if there were available rebates that would exist for electric vehicles in Pennsylvania. So after all of those, you get like a certain price about like 19000 And then, um, yeah, I was going to do a bunch more cost comparisons, but I realized it was doing some of the maths wrong. So I'm going to have to double check that. But that's sort of like where the um, direction of this project is headed right now. So for now, this is just draft form, but you guys get the picture and you can compare it to like the last infographic that I had. Um, definitely going to be a better design by the end. So yeah, that concludes all I have to say. Thank you. If the bureau has feedback to give on what they would potentially like to see in the infographics, that would also be great. But um, other than that, any questions and suggestions are welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Nuhan. Um, I, I, the, the first thing you said, one of the biggest barriers that you mentioned are, are, are the upfront costs. Mm. Um, life cycle costs for a while now for EVs have, have been lower than internal combustion engines, but uh, especially for those you know who can't afford the upfront costs, there, there's a barrier there. And I know some legislators are trying to look at ways that to provide incentives for used EVs. Um, as a way to lower those barriers. But uh, I think putting, um, consolidating lots of variables into an easily digestible assessment of, you know, what what is this, what is the decision process I need to use to, to make this perhaps higher up from costs you've, you've laid it out and you're, you're well on your way to helping us. A the theme we'll have moving forward in the climate action mission, we have a lot of work to do to educate folks um, on ways that they can actually do what they say they prefer to do anyway. They just don't know how to go about doing that. And this fits right in uh, right in line with that. So um, thank you, Nuhan. Uh, let's give Nuhan a round. Um, and um, I, uh, th that concludes the student presentation. But before we let them go, I, I really want to uh, say thank you to Maggie Douglas, who um, supervised these students through these projects and did a great job. And, um, I. I hope we did not frighten you and that we might be able to do this again uh, at your next capstone class and um, really, really do appreciate you um, working with us and working with the students um, on this. This is really, uh, to put it mildly, going to be really useful as we move forward. So thank you very much, students. Uh, you're welcome to stay. Uh, you're welcome to go. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes now talking about um, <clears throat> presenting uh, to council um, uh, what I will encourage them um, to post for com uh, public comment this evening um, 
is the Climate Action Commission's um, uh, what I call version one. Um, I say version one in recognition of the fact this will only remain relevant if treated as a living document. This has been the culmination um, of an effort lasting just over a year to provide a council plan or pathway to begin the process of focusing our climate mitigation efforts. I'd like to thank uh, the dozens of volunteers, students from multiple universities, we've, uh, residents, non-residents, um, and um, just folks uh, really stepping up to, to, to help inform what uh, I'm going to try to summarize in about 15 minutes if I can. Um, I would especially like to thank by, by name uh, the commission leads and the resident at large. Uh, the team leads were Sarah Markowitz uh, for the community engagement team. Our resident at large was Pamela Trussell. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Underwood, who's here tonight, was leading the Pathways and Analytics team, and Carla Farrell was uh, our zoning team lead. Mohamed Badisi was our Pathways, um, excuse me, our Projects and Estimates team lead. So um, thank you to everyone, particularly those by name who, who really uh, provided the leadership and perseverance in what was, to put it mildly, a very challenging year to do something, uh, let's just say, big. Uh, what you're going to find here is a strategy to begin the process of prioritizing and adjusting the, the borough's other key documents and policies to help us reach our greenhouse gas reduction targets. <clears throat> For several months, as you know, back in 2019 and running until May of 2020, Carlisle teamed up with Dickinson Center for Sustainability Education. It's part of a consortium of municipalities who participated in a local government climate action assistance program. Um, this, result, this effort resulted in establishing our baseline greenhouse gas inventory for Carlisle Borough, which you see there, and it provides the critical point of reference for future planning. Um, we teamed up with uh, ICLE, local governments for sustainable uh, communities, um, and they have been um, uh, providing educational technical modeling tools for multiple uh, municipalities throughout uh, the, the country. Um, and then, next slide please, shortly after completion of our greenhouse gas inventory, Borough Council finalized their climate action resolution, as you recall, in July 2020. Um, as in creating any plan, having targets and metrics are essential. So our targets are directly addressed by these two clauses in uh, the resolution. The first clause rec still recognizes Pennsylvania's current greenhouse gas reduction targets. The second clause recognizes that um, any future targets uh, may change, international, federal, or state, and we must recognize in the development of our plan. So this will likely prompt the need to revisit our, our plan as, a, as these targets will, will change and be adjusted. Um, next slide, please. The resolution uh, called for the formation of Climate Action Commission, which, uh, as you know, is acting as a special or select committee, um, can be dissolved at a moment's notice. But uh, we are going to push forward. Uh, this structure was developed based on consultation between Borough Council and staff. Executive Committee uh, was the voting membership of the Climate Action Commission, incorporates each of the 14 leads. Um, a Borough Council rep, who in our case was uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Schultz, uh, a borough rep, which in our case was a borough manager, Susan Armstrong, and a resident at large was Pamela Trussell. The pathways uh, for reaching Carlisle's climate goals um, are reflected in the climate action plan. Um, and uh, our, our objective tonight is to, um, I think there's one more bill, there you go, um, is to uh, recommend to council that we uh, present for public comment our version one of the climate action plan it is as they say ready for prime time um, next slide please so uh, back in March 2021 you were briefed on the climate action plans approval of the following pathway for shaping our mitigation strategy um, you can see that the various reductions uh, allocated to each of the five major reduction sectors uh, this table also rolls up, uh, as you can see on the right, uh, sorry about the tables and the numbers, but um, I think you can make through it. It shows the number of actions the Climate Action Commission recommended for further consideration in each sector. 
Um, I'm only, tonight I'm only going to brief the council on the high level objectives for each sector, but encourage you to review the climate action plan uh, for a more complete list of potential projects. Next slide, please. Thank you, Stephanie. Now, the, the ca uh, climate action plan is meant to focus further activities that have the best potential for reducing car laws and mitigation footprint and should be viewed that way as a strategic document. You'll see in the document, most of the specific objectives have placeholders for lead actors and metrics. Now that's reflective of the fact there are critical elements that require more deliberate process-driven decisions by council and staff. Any comprehensive policy analysis needs to integrate the community's core values that informs council's decisions moving forward. We have collected a robust set of comments through our community engagement team, and uh, we still await rolling up uh, all of those comments into what I call criteria for our policy decisions. Uh, that's a bit of a placeholder. I didn't feel uh, it would prevent us from revisiting version one of this plan. Uh, and I would not be surprised if we uh, were ready to present an update promptly based on those uh, what we call criteria, policy criteria. As you'll see in the Climate Action Plan's appendices when you read it, the document captures a great deal of planning and collaboration with community partners. But some of this data and information awaits a process <laughs> to coordinate the, the activities. Um, and I predictably uh, the efforts in the zoning team uh, in uh, assimilating uh, lots of information, uh, including draft ordinance development, but also um, some more um, ideas regarding uh, looking at housing density and different ways we can utilize our current housing and building stock. Uh, the Climate Action Commission will continue to collect information um, with your approval. Um, that we feel will be useful regardless of how the policy process evolves. Next slide, please. Um, while we have attempted to identify co-benefits of specific climate mitigation measures, including elements that would support some of the aforementioned plans, uh, say a, an adaptation plan or a community sustainability plan, um, it is important that you recognize this document, it remains focused on the core goals that prompted its creation, and that's carbon mitigation. Um, there is a temptation uh, in a lot of communities to roll everything into one document, and uh, we, moving forward, we felt important that we kept keep this document focused on what it was intended to be. Um, interesting, the, the, the uh, React, you know, the response to this plan actually prompted us to, to, to begin a sustainability working group to kind of coordinate some of these outliers that I'd say would have co-benefits in achieving our goals, but were maybe more directed to other sustainability targets. With your permission, we'll continue to move forward on those projects, but I, I, I would just um, have encourage us to think about uh, what process we might want to use uh, if we want to move forward with a separate adaptation plan or a separate community sustainability plan. Um, the community action, or the climate action plan does not recommend any specific outlays, uh, budget responses, or regulatory measures. That process is going is is going to be ongoing um, and will evolve as council evolves roles and responsibilities and identifies how other key document components such as the comprehensive plan stormwater management plans, zoning codes, and borough ordinances will reflect projects or action. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we continue uh, to uh, a deliberate process of collecting information from local universities and advocacy groups, such as the Clean Air Board, to provide some of the needed background to ensure our policy analysis process is fair and accurate. Um, on that last point, I'll get back to it. Um, I think. We have some recommendations from the commission about what our best employment would be moving forward. I'll get back to that. Um, I think it's an important thing we want to consider. Um, but I, at this point, I want to go ahead and sort of highlight the features of the plan. So next slide. Um, as you recall, we have the, the five major sectors. These are, we have three major um, objectives under the transportation plan. As we move to the next two or three slides, everything you see in well, let's move back and, and uh, maybe one more, give them a chance to, to look at the high level. Just to hide the, the, 
the um, text in red are um, specific projects that are sub object sub goals of those objectives and the reason i even bring that up is the the red items are the specific projects we recommend the climate action commission continue to work on to collect information to con to focus um our um uh, potential uh, recommendations on those specific um uh, actions that that will um prompt uh, us to, to to reorganize in a, in a way that I, I will recommend for council's consideration at the end of this um, slide deck but um, again the, the red is is uh, would be some of the projects that com uh, commission will be working on um, for the next um, I would say nine to twelve months um, as you can see um, <clears throat> uh, we we have specific objectives across the five sectors i there, there is a little bit of overlap in in the municipal operations we we have built a community greenhouse gas um, climate action plan reduction um, we did feel it was important to have to set aside specific goals that the public sector could achieve uh, uh, i think we can all agree we have a, a bit more control over uh, the processes we've used internally and we wanted to make sure we set ourselves to uh, set the standard so to speak um, for the wider community um, and that's why we have a separate uh, municipal operation objectives m1 and m2 um, next slide please um, so uh, again that was just high level as you look into the document you'll see um, some key things under each objective are specific projects some of them actually have goals associated with them. You'll also see what we assess as being the co-benefits um, of pursuing uh, specific actions. Um, and so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, what role the Climate Action Commission may have moving for forward um, uh, with your concurrence and unless otherwise directed, um, the Climate Action Commission will continue collecting information and beginning policy analyses um, on the six projects identified. Again, those were the red subprojects, working with our local partners, businesses, and universities. As I sort of highlighted earlier this evening, uh, we are in fact working on two of those projects as an environmental policy analysis with Dickinson beginning in the spring. Um, uh, we, we, you know, request council work with borough staff to determine um, maybe more long-term proper roles and responsibilities for the Climate Action Commission. Uh, and I asked the council to come back. It's weird asking myself to come back, but um, my hat on right now is chair of the Climate Action Commission primarily. And I think it is, in, it, it is um, critical that, you know, by the middle of summer, we, we have a little bit more sense of how this process goes forward. Different municipalities use their commissions in very different ways. Some of them are leading recommending bodies. Some of them are advisory in nature. Some of them are ad hoc. Uh, can't wait for Susan to introduce our new director, but I think we, we also have, um, uh, you know, we have a new leadership position that um, it's gonna need some time to get um, his feet underground and, and look forward to some really, you know, some bringing his experience, his wide experience here to inform how we move forward. So, Stephanie, the proposed reorganization would look a little bit like this. Uh, the two, two teams would remain prim really intact, as is the Pathways and Analytics team and the Community Engagement team on the right. Our zoning team and projects and estimates team sort of um, uh, combines into uh, more uh, uh, sector specific objectives and you can think of those as sort of transportation as its own thing um, energy decarbonization is more the supply side of the energy equation energy efficiency and behavior is sort of more on the demand side i think that's a uh, the commission liked that approach uh, we um, the second um, the request that i have from council in addition to making the plan available for public comment is to approve this new structure um, and, and our operations, as I discussed, moving forward. 
um, I think. Oh, and, and yeah, so this would, the, the executive committee would essentially um, look very similar, but in, 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 instead of the um, team leads, we would have the task force leads um, in, in addition to um, the two historic team leads. Um, um, and with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, I leave this for the council to deliberate. Thank you. Oh, I think that we could probably do this by unanimous consent. The, the objectives that you're talking about, if you would like to state them, uh, unless. I, I think that's appropriate. Um, I, I, I do want to give um, uh, some time to see if there's any immediate sort of um, response from, from council or, okay. or concern, but th that would, um, okay. considering how, how we posted it or whether there's any action we would want to take before we posted uh, the plan. So um, I, I move that we, we uh, uh, leave this up, you know, have a discussion with council to see if it, we think it's appropriate to go ahead and post the plan for public comment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in, sorry, friend. <laughs> you, have your, you have your thumb at the ready, but. Um, one, I want to recognize, as I did last night at our, our meeting, the tremendous amount of work that the commission did and all the volunteers. Um, Tony's here with us um, tonight. Um, Joel, this didn't happen without you taking it on your back and, and carrying it forward, too. So I think one of the smartest decisions I ever, ever made was saying, Joel, you have this expertise. You, you go for it. I'll get out of your way. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to know our limitations, right? Uh, but this this commission, I mean, over the last last year, um, each and every each and every month with the meetings, all the work in between uh, with the team meetings, um, Brenda was part of the, the zoning team. Um, so for for all the folks that Joel listed earlier, um, Tony, uh, Muhammad, Carla, uh, Sarah, who am I missing? I'm missing someone. And Mitch at the you know, and toward the, and Mitch toward, toward the end. Um, you know, pick pick it up, pulled teams together, and, and made this happen. Um, and it's yeah, it's a I think it's a pretty big deal for for our, our town. I mean, we're 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 a relatively large borough, um, but we're we're a relatively small small town in, in some ways. And we're going to take our we're going to do our part to to mitigate uh, our greenhouse gas emissions. And this is this is the beginning. This is the first big step. Um, so. What I, I would suggest we do tonight, keep this moving forward. We thought it was incredibly important to have a fair amount of, of public comment of at least uh, opportunity of at least 30 days. I'd suggest that we um, get the, the plan up on the website as soon as tomorrow, um, advertise that a uh, public comment period, um, and then look to, to, to adopt the plan uh, at our January 13th meeting. I think it's January 13th is our, our regular meeting um, at the beginning of the year. Um, I think we're, we're ready to keep keep it rolling. I actually just had one um, question on the last slide, uh, breaking down the new areas. Um, I'm on the zoning team and we are strangely passionate about zoning in all <laughs> areas. So, you know, when it looks like transportation, that's one, but, you know, housing is another one. And I'm just, um, uh, the one thing that I will just say, and this is this doesn't mean we have to change anything right now, just sort of a, um, an observation, was that sometimes some things that did come as like a priority, um, I don't think everyone else, you know, coming from the other teams necessarily have that zoning understanding. So there was some, there was some disconnect when we tried to, you know, try to, you know, even the way some things were broken down, they were residential and commercial, but for zoning, some of those things sort of overlapped um, uh, some of the priorities. So we kind of duplicated things in certain ways. So I guess my, my point is that the, our team was not that it's any better than anyone else's team because everyone else is really good but we <laughs> think it's not just you know carla has been awesome but everyone shows up and really puts the work in because we are all really excited about it so i just want to make sure that um you know if there's opportunities for us to continue working that it's it you know you don't have to pick and necessarily choose like that that educate like the knowledge that those folks have even if we don't have a zoning team so that's sort of my observation and just sort of 
thought process about breaking it up into those different areas. I wouldn't want to lose the ability of consulting with them or making them pick and choose. So, so um, thanks, Brent. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I, I certainly <laughs> wouldn't limit anyone's participation in any one team. Uh, we, we didn't, as you know, we made a, uh, we tried to make an attempt to, to create some inner team groups that, that just didn't quite materialize. Um, the works, obviously, the intergroup workings were, were really great. But, I mean, as you <clears throat> read through the document, especially look at the appendices with a lot of what your group did, we, uh, we have yet to fully integrate that with some of the work the other teams do. And we, um, that's a good lead in also to, to, to suggest. I, I think um, once it, uh, the commission responds to whatever public comments we, are appropriate, which we're prepared to do, um, I think we're pre also prepared to, to, to stand down for a, a few months, um, primarily mo motivated to retool and reorganize to make sure everyone um, is in a group that, that makes sense. That, that we, we have a process that when we hit the deck running again, potentially in, in March or April, that we, we, we have a, a real focus. Um, so, yeah. Any other, any other comments? I was just, just in, in response to, to Brenda's comment, I, I think for, and, and, and for Joel, I think perhaps what we could do with those task forces um, and that, that expertise that we had from the zoning team. I mean, you could imagine that in, a, in the different sectors that we're, we're trying to to uh, to mitigate that um, the zoning team sort of that that group could be called on, like as a you know the, the superheroes come in, the zoning superheroes come in and you know save save the day. We need something something done in this this area, um, and and we think there's a zoning or land use component of that. So you could you could sort of draw on it that that way. Thank you very much. Uh, and just echoing uh, Deputy Mayor's comments on, on thanking uh, Chair Chair Hicks and, and everyone um, for their work on this in Dickinson and, and the students. This is super exciting um, work and super important. I guess my only thought or suggestion potentially in that public comment period, if we could do a, a, maybe a Zoom um, where, Joel, you could go over here are the highlights because I think public comment is going to be important, but there might be residents that have questions that uh, don't fit in that box of public comment, just wondering um, what's going on that, that I think you'd be versed or anyone on the team um, to answer. So I just throw that out as a suggestion. And, and since this is such a big deal, perhaps a press conference, you guys haven't done one of those in a while. So to show what a big deal is, you, mm -hmm. you do a press conference and we just do highlights of the, of the plan and uh, get out there to get some more public input. I'll have to check with my publicist. I don't think that can be arranged. Um, I, I like. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Uh, actually, that that may um, mitigate. You know, I think there's going to be a temptation um, w when people's you know uh, are thinking about what we should do is is to um, assume we we this plan has specifics, um, a, you know, very um, directive things and. I think it's important for folks to realize that this is a strategy that the inputs we want for those specifics will come mm -hmm. and we want them to be here talking to us, but we're not, this is not a plan to uh, provide all the resources um, and specific projects and how we're going to do those projects yet. So um, hitting that, I think will save us some time maybe just alone with that. So good idea, Sean. And it also helps you control the narrative too. So that's also important. You know how I feel about that. <laughs> uh, any other comments on this? Um, I think we've heard, uh, council's heard the suggestions from deputy mayor to move forward. Any objection to that? No, so I think you have your marching orders, Joel and Sean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that's all I have tonight. Okay. All right. I, the pregnant pause. I know what was going on. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Moving on to uh, the regular agenda. Item number four on page two. Uh, due to the technology issues experienced during the 
November Borough Council meeting, all agenda items from the November meeting, which were voted on, will need to be acted on again. So I will entertain a motion for council to approve the following slate of items, section 4A through section 4H. So moved. Is moved by Deputy Mayor Schultz. Uh, is there a second? Second. We have, we, have a, we have a motion and a second. This will be a roll call vote. Madam Secretary, if you please. Mr. Gramsci? Aye. Ms. Fulham Winston? Aye. Mr. Hicks? Aye. Ms. Landis? Aye. Mr. Schultz? Aye. Mr. Stuvey? Aye. And Mayor Scott? Aye. Motion passes. And if you're playing along at home, that is everything on pages two, three, and four. Turning to page five of today's agenda. Parks and Recreation Committee. Hmm? I don't get these very often anymore for some reason. She, uh, she just told me, she tugged on my shoulder, she'll be back in five minutes, which is now four minutes. Someone keep the stopwatch. So I can go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have one action item tonight. Uh, uh, I recommend that Borough Council uh, enter into an agreement with the Carlisle Kiwanis Club to design, construct, and raise funds to completely replace and install a new Fort Latour at Latour Park, subject to Kiwanis complying with the terms and conditions of the attached agreement as prepared by the borough's solicitor. We have a motion. Is there a second? By me. I'll do that. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this item? Hearing none of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. And, and that I, completes my report. Thank you very much. Public safety. I move that uh, the council approve the Making Spirits Bright Parade, sponsored by the Borough of Carlisle, on Saturday, December 4th, 2021, from 11 a.m. to noon, with staging beginning at 10 a.m. Staging area will be west-south, from Southwest Street to South Hanover Street, and the parade route uh, South Hanover Street to West South Street to Lowther Street. There'll be no parking on East Lowther Street to North Bedford Street. Uh, and just a fun fact, this is the first year the borough will assume these responsibilities for the holiday parade. The parade will be held during daylight hours to augment other local holiday festivities planned by the borough um, and to uh, help downtown shops, restaurateurs, and agencies like the DCA. The daytime parade will provide opportunities for the community and visitors to support small business. And we have a motion. Yes, and a second. Thank you. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. That ends my report. It would have been embarrassing if we didn't approve our honor for it. <laughs> I know. There's always that chance, though. <laughs> Ms. Fuller Winston. Thank you. Public Works. <laughs> we have two items tonight. The first, I ask Borough Council to authorize the reduction in the amount of financial security posted by Builders Services Group Incorporated for the Phase 1 land development plan for Northside Village on Lot 4 of the former IAC site in the amount of $254,640. Ms. Phil Winston moves the council authorize the reduction in the amount of financial security. Do we have a second? Second. A motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. And second, I ask for our council to award the bids for various chemicals used at the water and wastewater plants to the lowest responsive bidders outlined in the attached tabulation of bids received document. The annual contract term shall be January 1, 2022 to December 31, 2022. Ms. Willem Winston moves to award bid contracts for chemicals for the water and wastewater plants. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Anything further on this? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. And that completes my report. All right. Now we're up to new business. Does anyone have any new business they'd like to bring before council? All right. Public comment. We do this now. Uh, anyone like to make a uh, address council on an item of borough government that we haven't talked about? Or maybe that we have. I don't know. All right. All right, here, seeing no further business, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.